Welcome to the HR Chat Show, one of the world's most downloaded and shared podcasts designed for HR pros, talent execs, tech enthusiasts, and business leaders. For hundreds more episodes and what's new in the world of work, subscribe to the show, follow us on social media, and visit hrgazette.com. Hello, I'm Pauline James, CEO of Anchor HR, and I'm thrilled to be partnering with David Krillman, CEO of Krillman Research and the HR Chat Podcast on a series to help HR pros and leaders navigate AI's impact on organizations, jobs, and people. With the rise of AI and its profound impact on HR, this series seeks to assist our community in being both thoughtful and proactive. In this episode, we explore... How can AI's evolving role reshape industries and work practices? And what guidance applies to both organizations adopting this technology and workers? Joining us on the show is Avi Goldfarb. Avi Goldfarb holds the esteemed position of Rotman Chair in Artificial Intelligence and Healthcare at the University of Toronto and is a professor of marketing at Rotman School of Management. He is also Chief Data Scientist at the Creative Destruction Lab and a Research Associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. His contributions span various fields, including marketing, economics, law, and more. His work has been referenced in White House reports, The New York Times, The Economist, and elsewhere. Along with A.J. Agrawal and Joshua Gans, Avi is the author of best-selling books, Prediction Machines and Power and Prediction. Avi, given you are a leading expert on AI internationally with deep connections where David and I are also based here in Toronto, we know that you will have tremendous insights to share, which will be valuable for our audience. Beyond our introduction, can you take a minute to tell the HR Chat listeners about yourself? Sure. I'm a professor at the University of Toronto in the Rotman School. I have a different take on technology, I think, than most of the people who talk about technology, which is that I'm an economist. I'm unabashedly an economist. I think about the world in terms of constraints, in terms of supply and demand, and demand curves and supply curves and things like that. And that lens informs just about everything I do in thinking about the how technology is going to affect society, how technology is useful in business, and technology in HR. Abby, you've been studying AI well before it became famous, you might say. Has anything surprised you in the recent advances? Yeah, we started looking at AI in 2012. We run this program called the Creative Destruction Lab, which is a program for science-based startups that we started here in Toronto in 2012. And there was this company in the lab called Atomwise. And honestly, my biggest AI surprise was seeing this company saying they were going to use artificial intelligence for drug discovery. And this was 11 years ago. And 11 years ago, that idea just seemed crazy, that some technology called artificial intelligence could help with anything. Then through the lab, we saw this trickle of companies every year, a few more, And in 2015, that's when we had enough startups applying to our lab, partly because we were based in Toronto and between Toronto and Waterloo, there was a lot of AI on the research side, a lot of AI expertise that we had 25 AI based startups, which at the time was the most AI companies anywhere in the world. At that moment, the tech investment world started paying attention. And so our AI stream at the lab the day before the stream would happen. The flight from San Francisco was filled with people coming to see what we were doing or what our companies were doing more precisely. Facebooks and others of the world were really starting to invest tens, hundreds of millions and more into AI. And so the potential and the excitement of the technology, in some sense, clear as early as 2015. And that led to our first book. We wrote this book, Prediction Machines, came out in 2018 saying, hey, you know, there's this technology, computational statistics prediction, it's getting much better in that format if it's gonna change the way the world works. And then the biggest surprise number two is we wrote that book in 2018 thinking this revolution was about to happen and it didn't. 2019, 2020, pandemic happened, everything went digital. We're like, okay, for sure it's now. And it still didn't happen. There was excitement in the tech world, but it didn't seem to be affecting everyday life. Why hasn't what we predicted in prediction machines come true led to our second book called Power and Prediction which unpacked the challenges in using AI at scale. Then finally, in November 2022, ChatGPT was released. And when ChatGPT was released, it became clear to just about everybody outside the tech world what these technologies would be able to do in terms of writing. And then people started paying attention to image generation and movies and all these to the current hype and excitement. The ChatGPT, the ability of machines to write 
happened sooner than I expected, for sure. But the technology itself wasn't the surprise. If anything, the surprise was that for me was that it took so long from, wow, look at what these technologies can do by based on 2012 and 2018 to everybody else noticing around 2022. You talked about your book, uh, Prediction Machines, and that word prediction has come up several times. Maybe you can explain to our audience why you see AI in terms of prediction. Sure. So the core technology underlying the current excitement in AI is a technology called machine learning. And machine learning is, in a technical sense, it's a branch of computational statistics. If we called you know, our book The Simple Economics of Computational Stats, I recognize no one would buy it and people wouldn't be so excited to have us on podcasts, but that's what's going on under the hood. It is stats. And you know, one of the main things we do in stats is predict in a statistical sense. So by prediction, it can be about the future, but it doesn't have to be. It's just this process of filling in missing information. So in the stats world, when we talk about prediction, it's filling in missing information. So that can be about the future. How is this person going to perform in the company if we hire them? It can be about the present. How can we fill in this gap on a form that we don't know? It could even be about the past. We don't know what this person was doing 10 years ago. What are our best guesses and what that might look like? But it's prediction. It's this process of filling in missing information. That's the key to understanding what this technology is in a direct sense. And then once you understand that it's prediction, you can get a sense of what its strengths and weaknesses are and the role of humans in working with AI. So if it's prediction, we recognize statistical prediction. Now the benefit of data becomes clear because that's the core input in stats is data. And so the core input into statistical prediction is going to be data. And a prediction doesn't tell you what to do. So in decision-making, a prediction tells you the state of the world. It tells you what's going on, but it doesn't tell you what to do. Determining what to do requires some sense of what matters, what you value. That human judgment, figuring out what matters to us, what we value, is a core role for human AI takes off as prediction machines get better and better. Thanks for tuning in to the HR Chat Podcast. If you're enjoying this episode, We'd really appreciate it if you could subscribe and leave a five-star review on your podcast platform of choice. And now, back to the conversation. Avi, you have an interesting and arguably hopeful perspective that AI may become more of an equalizer across professions than past advances in tech have been. Can you tell us more about that? Absolutely. There's a lot of worry that's saying, hey, AI is going to take jobs. AI is going to take all jobs and the rich are just going to get richer. Where does that come from? So let's just start with that point. The first place it comes from is if we look at the technologies we've seen over the past 50 years, particularly computers and the internet, that's been the story. That computers and the internet, the people who are good at abstract thinking, who are already doing well, have done better and better. And everybody else, they haven't done worse, but they've been left behind. And so... The expectation is, hey, we have AI. It seems like the next generation of information technology. Given what happened with computing and the internet, we should expect the same with artificial intelligence. And the counter argument, what I hypothesize, I want to be clear, we don't know yet, but what I hypothesize is going to happen with my co-authors of Jay and Joshua is something quite different, which is if you think about what AI does, what prediction technology has been doing, it often is replacing those tasks that the higher paid workers are doing. So in medicine, the core role of prediction in medicine is around diagnosis and treatment. And diagnosis is the special domain of, of physicians, of the doctors, the highest paid people in the profession. Once you have a good diagnosis, a lot of the actions to take to help treat somebody are done by nurses and pharmacists and others. And so what prediction in the healthcare industry has potential to do is mean we need fewer doctors, especially at the primary care level, fewer the higher paid people, because the prediction can then be handed to a nurse or a pharmacist or another medical professional. And they can help you with the actual treatment, with navigating the stress of the healthcare system and all these other things that doctors do, but aren't really what they're trained for. In a lot of industries, what we've seen so far as the newer generations of prediction machines, newer generations of AI start infiltrating the industry is that they're not that useful often to the people at the top. Because what they're doing for the people at the top of many, many industries is showing them how to do things well 
and they already do things well. In another study by Eric Brynjolfsson and Lindsay Raymond on call centers, they looked at the implementation of generative AI in a call center. Okay, so what was it? It was a salesperson, effectively, and they were getting a script. The best people in the call center, the people who had experience and were really, really good at it, the script was basically telling them what they already would have said. If anything, it was distracting them. But the people who were new and the people who weren't as good were getting a script that looked like the script of the people who were at the top. And it made them much more productive. Another example in the taxi industry, where there was an AI in Japan that was implemented to help taxi drivers identify where there were likely to be people who needed to be picked up. Okay, so where they were going to get rides. And for the best taxi drivers, people who were very, very productive, it made almost no difference. They already knew. But for the people who were relatively inexperienced, who were relatively low wages and often had their cabs empty, it made a big difference. There's lots of these examples, both from research and then also hypothesized, where we can see what is the AI doing here within a workflow in an industry? It's often helping the people at the bottom of the industry be more like the people at the top. And in that sense, it has real potential to be equalizing. That's the message that we have in, in our Brookings paper, our science paper, and it doesn't have to be like computing in the internet. But as I said, we are still in early stages and there's forces that are going both ways. And until we see how it all plays out, whether it's more or less equalizing or just a wash, is still an open question. The thing that I'm really optimistic about though, where I don't think there are forces going on either side, is the more macro question of, okay, well, if machines are taking the jobs, are there still going to be jobs? I think that the answer unequivocally is yes. And I don't think this force is going both directions. There's two reasons for this. First, it's a weird question because like as much as we work and spend a lot of our time at work, it's not the most fun thing we do over the course of the week. And, you know, think about the great victories of the 20th century labor movement. They're about, well, we only have to work 40 hours in a week. We get weekends, we get vacation, we get a childhood, we get retirement. Those are all wonderful things. And so working less at the margin is probably what most people want. Okay, but taking that aside, the way we should expect things to play out is that as certain parts of the economy get more and more productive, the remaining parts, parts that haven't been so productive, become a bigger, bigger part of the economy and have more and more jobs. We saw that with agriculture. So it used to be most of our ancestors worked in agriculture. And as agriculture got more and more productive, it actually became a smaller and smaller part of the economy. It's almost like a paradox that as we get abundance in agriculture, we have fewer people who are working in agriculture and it becomes less important to the overall economy. Same thing happened in manufacturing over the last 50 years or so. As it got more and more productive, it became a smaller part of the economy. And now there's some sense that parts of the service economy are moving in that direction, but clearly not all parts. And so there's real reasons to be optimistic that there's gonna be plenty of jobs in the future just like very few of us are working in agriculture today, they might be different. And that transition may be challenging because we'll need to learn some new skills and you know, and the anxiety of unemployment is never a good thing. But the jobless future is not where we're going. To the extent that there's pessimism, it's about the short run, not the long run. Thank you. Can you provide your thoughts on how long you predict it will be until we see broad sweeping changes in how we work and how it's organized? So depends on the industry. And unfortunately, I don't know which industry is first. So I can say, hey, we have some industries that have already been transformed by AI, most notably the advertising industry. So advertising in the 1980s and the 1990s and before, I don't know if you've ever seen the TV show Mad Men. Until the 90s, it kind of worked that way with a lot of charm and a lot of handshaking and guessing about what was working and what wasn't. Then the internet came along. And for my dissertation, this is what I was studying in, in the 1990s, there was this new advertising supported internet and it looked a lot like the magazine industry. It was sold like the magazine industry, priced like the magazine industry. You know, instead of opening up People Magazine telling you, okay, you're, you're gonna pay this much for every million impressions, you do the same thing on Yahoo or somewhere else. Then toward the late 90s and especially in the early 2000s, people realized they could use the data about users to predict their wants and needs. And by using that data to predict who wanted what when, you could then target your advertising much, much more effectively. That in turn led to a transformation of the advertising industry and moved from this very non-tech focused industry where there were pricing lists and things moved kind of slowly. You'd set up your advertising months in advance often to the industry we see today with real-time bidding on ads, with auctions, with potentially thousands of players happening every time you open up your screen. 
That transformation is possible because of machine learning. It's possible because we can predict who wants what and when. And, and there's been disruption in that industry. It's now a much bigger industry than it used to be, but it's different people at the front of it. Now, which industries are coming next? That's tricky because the industries that I think have the biggest potential are often the ones that are hardest to change. I hold a chair in artificial intelligence and healthcare. Why do I hold a chair in artificial intelligence and healthcare? Because it is clearly an industry that could massively benefit from what machine learning, what prediction machines can do. At the same time, changing healthcare is really hard. It's hard for some good reasons and some not so good reasons, but there's good reasons why we're cautious in healthcare, because when we make a mistake, especially if we make a mistake at scale, it has real meaningful consequences for a lot of people. And so healthcare is an industry that if we could figure it out, the transformation is going to be enormous. 40 years from now, I'm confident we'll figure it out. But whether it's going to be two years from now or 40 years from now, I have no idea. Other industries seem to be changing more quickly, like financial services and insurance. But the transformation of those industries is probably less extreme than what might be seen in healthcare. Now, you told us that computers are not going to take all our jobs, but you've also yeah. indicated that we can expect to see a lot of change. Yeah. So what's your advice for people either in the workforce or soon to enter the workforce? So expect change is the best on the soon to enter the workforce. You know, there was this, I'm not sure how long this has been not true for, but this old story that, hey, you, you have your education and then at 18 or 21 or 25, you're done. And then you go off into the workforce and then you work for 40 to 50 years and then you retire. That world, even if it did exist over the past 20 years, I think is gone. The expectation for everybody should be the jobs will continually change and the skills required will continually change. Writing remains a core skill over time as uh, our generative writing models like ChatGPT get better and better. Writing, the act of figuring out how to structure prose well and parse the rules of English grammar is going to be less and less important of a skill. But knowing how to use those kinds of tools in order to help serve your stakeholders will continue to be important. And exactly what skills are required for serving your stakeholders if it's not writing is, depending on the industry, an open question for 10 years from now or 20 years from now. But the key advice is just recognize your education's not done. You've also done a lot of work with entrepreneurs on this new technology. You were talking about how at, at U of T, you had the biggest group of AI entrepreneurs at, at one point. But let's flip it over, not from the people selling a new technology to the people buying a new technology. And you've got this tension because you don't want to be left behind. By the same token, you don't want to buy some bleeding edge product that doesn't work. So how should a buyer of this technology approach it? There's three things a buyer needs to think about. The first is, what is it that they're predicting? So they say they have an AI tool. That means they're using some information to generate some other information. And so you need to understand what is the underlying prediction that they're saying, hey, if it's in hiring, are they predicting who the current HR managers at your company hire? Are they predicting who gets promoted in the company? Are they predicting who some other set of companies hire? Those details matter for you in terms of figuring out whether this is going to be a useful prediction for your company. So first point is, what's their target and their predictions? Even if you had perfect information on that thing, is that something you can use? Point number two is, how is this going to be useful in your workflow? Is this going to allow you to do what you always did, but a little bit better? Is this going to help save on some cost that you outsource? Is this going to help save on reduced jobs in a particular part of the organization? Hold that thought for a second. Or is this going to enable you to, to do something different than you could before? The highest potential ones are when you can do something different than what you did before, but that's always harder. Reducing costs on outsourcing or allowing you to do what you always did, but a little bit better. Those are often, at least in the short run, good reasons. Our experience is anybody who's trying to sell on the, on the entrepreneurship side uh, to reduce costs cost by allowing you to eliminate jobs. Even the people who buy those tend to be disappointed. Most people don't want to do things in order to help them fire people. That's just not of interest. But it's also a lot harder to eliminate a job than people expect. Technology typically allows you to make certain processes more efficient or identify certain parts of an individual's workflow that can be automated. But to automate a whole job is hard. The best example from history here is telephone operators. It used to be the number one job in the U.S., 
especially for young women, millions of young women work for AT&T as telephone operators. The first person to try to automate that job got a patent for an automatic telephone operator in 1890, long time ago. The last telephone operator stopped working at AT&T in 1978. It took 88 years to figure out how to completely automate that job. Because just the telephone, it was a small piece of the overall puzzle. So if you're on the buying side, what you should be looking for is first, what is the prediction? Two, you know, how is it really going to help you? And then three, what is the data that that company is using that allows them to make this prediction? And you don't have to understand the map. They're going to say all these words that you don't understand. You got to cut through those and focus on the questions of, okay, what is the data that's going to allow you to predict? And then once it's deployed in my company, what's the data that's going to allow you to adapt to the world as it changes. And if they don't have good answers for that, it doesn't matter how much math they do. It all, in the end, depends on the data and we have garbage in and garbage out. So they need good information to generate other good information. Thank you. Abby, this was a short and really helpful and interesting discussion. If the audience would like to learn more about your work, what's the best way for them to do so, in addition to reading your latest book, Power and Prediction? Okay, I was going to say, read the book, Power and Prediction, and follow me on Twitter or LinkedIn. And the book came out about a year ago. And since then, we've been releasing HBR articles every month or two that give a sense of our updated perspective based on the advances in generative AI and other tools. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the HR Chat Show. If you enjoyed this episode, why not subscribe and listen to some of the hundreds of episodes published by HR Gazette. And remember, for what's new in the world of work, subscribe to the show, follow us on social media, and visit hrgazette.com.